Chag Sameach. It is wonderful to be together on this Yom Tov celebrating Sukkot. And I'm going to give you Rabbi Starr's free financial advice today. Now, I know that I'm a rabbi and, you know, left brain, right brain. I'll tell you, not a lot of people think about a rabbi and his math skills. But today I'm going to give you the insight. I think everybody should hold on to their houses, their homes. If you have a place up north, really hold on to it. Because I'm convinced a generation from now, 20 to 30 years, everybody is going to see Michigan as the place to be. No longer will they be moving to Florida or Arizona, not Atlanta or California. Michigan is going to be the place to be. Now why? It's not such good news. But we know due to climate change, due to the increased severity of natural disasters, that it's just a matter of time before California falls into the sea, that Miami no longer exists, and everybody will say, where can we go where there are no hurricanes? Where can we go where there are no major earthquakes? Where can we go where there are no real significant natural disasters? Where can we go where fresh water is abundant? And they're going to say, aha, Michigan. I'm convinced of it. So let's all stay here as long as we possibly can. Hold on to everything we got, because it's going to be worth a fortune a generation from now. That is, of course, if Michigan does a little better job of protecting its fresh water supply and we don't keep selling it to bottled water companies. We have this incredible resource of water around us and we take it so much for granted. We forget that we can go play in the water whenever we want. We forget that essentially we can stick a cup in most of our water supplies and drink it and it's really no problem. How blessed we are by this incredible amount of fresh water that surrounds us, that we almost take it for granted. At this holiday of Sukkot, we really come to reflect on the significance of water in our lives. Of course, Sukkot is the holiday in which we pray for rain. Well, not exactly. There's a wonderful conversation, one of my favorite conversations in the Talmud, actually, comes to do with this holiday of Sukkot, and when should we begin to pray for rain, of course, in the land of Israel and not in Southfield? When should we begin to pray for rain there in the Promised Land? Should it be the first day of Sukkot? Because after all, this is the beginning of the rainy season in Eretz Yisrael. This is the time where we really begin to think about the fact that God will reward us for following the mitzvot or punish us for failing to follow the mitzvot based on the rainy season in Eretz Yisrael. That's, again, why Sukkot is so tied into this season of judgment idea. And so in the Talmud, the rabbis say, we should begin praying for rain at the first day of Sukkot. And then the rabbis come and say, wait a second. If we begin praying for rain at the beginning of Sukkot, how are we ever going to be able to sleep and eat out in our sukkah as if it's raining the whole time? And so in a wonderful act of Yiddish cup, they say, aha, we won't begin praying for rain at the beginning of Sukkot. We can't live out in our sukkahs. We can't eat in our sukkahs. People are traveling to and from Yerushalayim. And so instead, we'll begin praying for rain at the end of Sukkot. And so sure enough, a week from today, we will gather here again in this main sanctuary. And on Shemini Atzeret, which is really just after Sukkot, on Shemini Atzeret, we will transition from praying for Du, Morid Hatal, to Mashiva Ruch, Morid Agashem, to praying and celebrating God as the one who makes the wind blow and causes the rain to fall. And that will be just after the Sukkot holiday. But nevertheless, this whole holiday of Sukkot is tied in with water and with rain. And I want to take a look uh, at some of the discussion as to what happened 2,000 years ago in the days of the Holy Temple, where our rabbis and our tradition and our people really took note of the importance of water. After all, our people are a desert people. For thousands of years, we hoped and prayed for just the right amount of rain and that the rain should come at just the right time and in just the right places. 
because too much rain or too little rain meant starvation or it meant death. And so water is essential to our people's story. You're welcome to look with me at the sheet here that we put together about the festival of water. And of course, as we read earlier this morning from Leviticus chapter 23, on the first day you shall take the product of Hadar trees, branches of palm trees, both of leafy uh, trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. That's what we'll do when we take Lulav and Etro. You shall observe it as a festival of the Lord for seven days in the year. You shall observe it in the seventh month as a law for all time throughout the ages. You shall live in booths seven days. All citizens in Israel shall live in these booths, these Sukkot, in order that future generations may know that I made the Israelite people live in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I, the Lord, your God. So what does our Torah tell us here about praying for water? What does the Torah tell us here about any sort of water rituals with regard to Sukkot? What does the Torah tell us about the role of water in the Beit HaMikdash and the Holy Temple? The answer, of course, is nothing. Absolutely nothing. So we come now to our mission. The book of Jewish law, some 2,000 years old, that was written by the earliest of rabbis. And all of a sudden they're talking, and I'm now here where it says chapter 4, Mishnah 9. They're all of a sudden talking about this idea called Simchat Beit HaShoeva, the festival of the water libations. Some point between the Torah and the Mishnah, we all of a sudden have a major celebration on Sukkot having to do with water. How are the water libations done, the Mishnah asks. Not should they be done, not if they're going to be done, but how should they be done? A golden flask that could hold three logim, right, essentially a liter and a half of water, was filled from the Shiloh spring at the, the bottom of Yerushalayim. When they would arrive with it at the gate of water, they would blow a tekiah, a trua, and a tekiah. Right? They didn't just march up with a two liter bottle three quarters of the way full. They blew the shofar, it was a major deal. And if that weren't enough, the sages said, anyone who's never seen the rejoicing at the place of the water drawing, anyone who's never seen the simchat beit ha has never seen rejoicing in all his days. This water libation ceremony, as strange as it sounds, was the biggest party of the year in all of Eretz Yisrael. The Mishnah continues. At the departure of the first holy day of the festival, all the people would descend into the women's court, and they would arrange there a great arrangement. And four candelabras were there and four golden basins at their head and four ladders to each one. And upon them were four of the rising youth of the priesthood and in their hand were jars of oil holding 120 logi, which they would pour into each of the basins. Now imagine, we took this little bit of water, right? We talked about three logi, about a liter and a half. And here they have 120 logi of oil. So, oil and water. From the worn out pants of the priests and from their worn out belts they would tear pieces. And they would use them as wicks to light with them. And there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not illuminated by the light of the place of the water drawn. So it would be this time of year at night time that they would light up the entire city of Jerusalem, Burning all this oil with all these wicks. Right? The city at darkness was literally awash in flames. Pious people and men of great deeds would dance before them with lit torches in their hands and sing songs and praises. And the Levites would play with lutes and harps and cymbals and trumpets and countless musical instruments upon the 15 steps which were sent into the women's court, corresponding with the 15 songs of ascent in the Psalms, that upon them the Levites would stand with their musical instruments and sing. And it keeps going on. It talks about how they would celebrate all night and into the morning and the shofar would blast and the music would play. And they would dance and they would sing in celebration. And what they would do is pour a little wine into a basin. And they would pour a little water into a basin. And there they would celebrate and pray for a successful rainy season. Water was at the heart of this Sukkot holiday. 
And in fact, it was so important, this holiday, this, this aspect of the holiday, and it was so controversial that the Sadducees, some of the Sadducees, right, primarily the priesthood at the time, would say, wait a second, we don't see this idea of water anywhere in the Torah. This Simchat Beit HaShoeva, this water libation. And so they would actually try to undermine the service. And so a wonderful discussion in the Mishnah has these priests, these Sadducees, trying to undermine the appropriate rituals of the service. And you can imagine the entire town is turned out and they're dancing and singing and the flames are blasting and everyone's surrounding and they're watching these Sadducees try to corrupt the service. So what do all the people of the city do when they see these priests, these Sadducees, trying to ruin the service for everybody? Apparently, they all took their etrogion and began pelting them down at the Sadducee who was trying to screw up the ceremony. It's a great line. I love it. But that's how important this was because our ancestors sought water. They desperately needed and wanted water. And so they threw the biggest party of the year in prayer and in hope to God that there should be water. Now it's pretty easy in Israel now to obtain water. How many, how many of you remember the first time you were in Israel and you went to take a shower or to wash your hands and you were conscious, right, of how much water you used? I remember being told not to put soap on while the water is running. That you literally had to get yourself wet, turn off the water, soap up and shampoo up, turn on the water, do a quick rinse and get out because water was as a scarcity. But now in Israel, water is so plentiful. They're actually exporting water to other countries around the world. Water is so plentiful in Israel that they've figured out how to pull water out of the air and make water from the air. Now I'll tell you, that's the precursor to Messianic times. Because as we look at our Haftarah for yesterday, for tomorrow, for, pardon me, our Haftarah for today and tomorrow, as we look at the messianic vision of our ancestors, it had to do with the idea that water would be plentiful in the land of Israel. And we're there. Now here we are at the Sukkot holiday. And we're going to go drink until we want to drink no more with all the water that we have. We can shower as long as the hot water lasts. And if you want, you can continue showering thereafter. Because we have all the water in the world that we could possibly want. But at this holiday of Sukkot, as we remind ourselves of the Simchat uh, Beit HaShoeva, this water libation ceremony, we realize that we ought to be grateful for the amount of water we have and the amount of water that exists in Eretz Yisrael. And all the more so, we have to work together as a community, as a state, as a country, and as one people around the world to recognize how blessed we are to have water, that we have to protect that water, that we have to keep it clean and make sure all those who need to drink have the opportunity. This holiday of Sukkot, may we recommit ourselves to water purity, to water cleanness, and to protecting our water supply, that truly each and every day for us can be a Simchat Beit HaShoeva, a day of celebrating with water. Can you hear us? So may this be God's will. And let us say together.